there's some problems with string theory, and one of the problems is that string theory is only makes sense mathematically in at least 10 dimensions. All right, Professor Halpern, thank you for joining me today. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, um, for listeners that might not be familiar with you, why don't you give a little bit of your background just so uh, before we get into your book? Well, I'm a professor of physics at St. Joseph's University in Philadelphia, and I've written 18 popular science books, starting with Time Journeys back in 1990, and my latest book published this year is The Allure of the Multiverse. I'm a fellow of the American Physical Society. I've received a Guggenheim Fellowship, Fulbright Scholarship, and the Athenium Society Literary Award. So, and, I'm, and uh, those are some of the things I'm you know, most proud of in terms of my academic career. I have The Allure of the Multiverse right here. I finished reading it yesterday. So what uh, inspired you to write it, first of all? Well, I've always been interested in science fiction since I was a child. Um, one of my childhood memories is, is getting to hear the great science fiction writer Isaac Asimov speak when he came to Philadelphia. And I asked him a question about black holes. I don't remember specifically what his response was, but I read a lot of science fiction. I was reading about higher dimensions and parallel universes and things like that in my, um, my readings of fiction and seeing movies along those lines. I love time travel movies and parallel universe movies. And then in terms of my academic background, I got a PhD from Stony Brook University and my research topic was looking at chaos in cosmology. So I was looking at uh, models of the universe that are a little bit different than the standard model. In the standard model, uh, the Big Bang expands equally in all directions, pretty much evenly. And I was looking at what are called anisotropic models that expand differently in different directions, and in fact, um, could even uh, oscillate in their expansion, a little bit like an accordion um, in some of the directions. And they display what is called chaotic behavior, that is behavior that's deterministic, but essentially unpredictable, um, which is which is pretty cool. So I got my PhD in that area. And since then, I've been writing books, mostly to take a break from mathematics. I like mathematics, but I also like writing. And uh, recent years, I saw how many movies there are out about the multiverse from the Marvel Cinematic Universe movies to everything, everywhere, all at once. And, um, you know, I saw the, saw that there was a growing interest in these movies. And I thought, well, maybe I can combine my expertise, expertise in alternative models of the universe with an interest in these more wild cultural ideas to write a book about ideas of the multiverse, both in science and in culture. Yeah, you mentioned everything everywhere all at once in the beginning of your book. And I actually ended up watching that, I think, the night that I started reading the book or the, the day after. So it's a pretty interesting movie. My girlfriend uh, wasn't into it at first and then got into it with more of the, uh, I, don't, I don't know, romantic parts or uh, whatever. She, she enjoyed it, but it was a really interesting uh, movie. Uh, so it seems like they're... Uh, and you do a really good job of going over the entire history of how the multiverse uh, theory came into play or how the multiple multiverse theories have come into play. And uh, I had an, an, uh, a space on X yesterday where I was just sourcing, I was seeing if anyone had any thoughts of like what they would want asked. And I had one person jump on and, and she kind of went on a monologue and talked for about 30 minutes and I couldn't, I, at the end I had to tell her, I, I don't know any way I can condense what you're saying into anything I can ask. And the only reason I bring that up is because Stephen Hawking, you, uh, your book is very digestible and Stephen Hawking and uh, Einstein are two scientists that come to my mind as people who are geniuses, but they made their ideas very 
relatable to people. They made their ideas accessible to the public. Am I wrong in saying that? Well, they were both um, brilliant physicists, but also really had a a passion for popularization. And uh, Einstein wrote a um, couple of popular works about relativity, about his ideas about us, science in general. And he's always enjoying speaking to the public about his ideas. And uh, the same with Stephen Hawking. Uh, they're, they're similar in a way because both became icons of scientific genius and uh, were called upon to deliver opinions on a vast variety of subjects. So, uh, for example, Einstein would be asked his opinions about religion or his opinions about politics. Even one day, I found a reporter asked Einstein whether or not he believed in Santa Claus. And, <laughs> and Einstein tried to change the topic and the reporter would kept insisting that Einstein said his opinion. And I thought, wow, poor guy, you know, they were reporters were hounding him to express his opinion about everything, even things well outside his domain. And uh, the same with Hawking. Um, people would ask him about whether or not there's extraterrestrials and uh, things like that. And he had a sense, good sense of humor about it. Yeah, it's kind of funny how that happens in, in every field. You become popular and then everyone wants your opinion on things that have nothing to do with what your expertise is on. So it's kind of funny how that happens. But they both were very accessible. And I, I feel like your book was very accessible. And well, thank you. Um, maybe you can dive into the importance of that because it doesn't matter how good of an idea you have. And I, I believe history is full of people who have genius ideas but they can't express them to the public. How important is it for you to be able to make these concepts accessible to the general public? Yeah, well, um, I consider myself kind of an individual with a lot of interests and a lot of uh, passions. And, you know, one of my passions early on was, was to write. And, uh, you know, I kind of started thinking about that writing when I was an undergraduate, so in college, so many years ago, and uh, wanted to write books. And I think it's because I read so many popular science books when I was a kid by people like George Gamov and Isaac Asimov, Martin Gardner, and so forth. And I really appreciated how they conveyed science to me, uh, to the public, and, and, and it resonated with me. And uh, I wanted to kind of do the same. So um, I got my PhD with the goal of someday being a popularizer. And uh, that worked out really well because the year after I got my PhD, um, I was working in Hamilton College and putting together material for a talk about the nature of time. And I started writing a book on the topic. And I didn't have a literary agent at the time. I didn't have a publisher I was working with. So I just sent the manuscript out cold to a bunch of publishers and I got interest from McGraw Hill and I'm always very grateful that started off my career and they took, you know, an unknown person. And I think it was indeed because of Hawking's popularity. They thought, well, someone else is writing about time. Uh, maybe we have a chance of selling some books, not like Hawking's brief history of time was a bestseller, but they thought, well, if we could get even, you know, one hundredth of the sales of that book maybe will will do well. And uh, you know, my first book, Time Journeys, was my own impressions about time. And uh I was really gratified to get a prize for that book, a writing prize, and uh to get interest. And uh it's just been really exciting for me to see how much interest there's been in in my writings and uh it, you know it inspires me to keep going. Awesome. Yeah, I, I think it's absolutely necessary to have people that can relay these ideas because especially physics, I, I believe people look at physics and they're like, oh, no, that's way too complicated to understand. And and like I said, uh, Stephen Hawking was somebody who made a lot of very complex ideas very accessible too. And yeah, I read uh, 
one of his books. I can't remember which one, but it was it was a great book. And I was like, oh, I kind of understand some of this stuff now. And that's how I felt after reading your book. I want to relay a story um, because I feel like this will touch on myths or maybe maybe it won't be a myth. But about a year ago, I was with some friends and acquaintances and we were, I think I might have brought up the idea of parallel universes. And uh, somebody in the group said, well, I like the idea of parallel universes because uh, she was playing a game and she said, well, if I lose, I can say, well, there's a universe where I won that game. And I said, well, that kind of seems a little absurd because then if, if every possibility is an actuality in some other universe, then that isn't the only other universe that would exist. There'd be a universe where you died and not just died, but died in every possible way. And then there'd be a universe where you stubbed your toe and you'd stub your toe on different things and all these different things. Like it seems like an infinite amount of possibilities when you consider a parallel universe in that sense, like every possible thing could have an infinite more possibility. So it becomes just an infinite mess in a sense. Would that be more along the lines of myth as far as multiverse is concerned or is there some truth in what she was saying? So that I would call, and I called in my book, the cultural idea of the multiverse, which is the multiverse in literature and uh, stories like All the Myriad Ways by Larry Niven, which imagines what would happen if we had access to all the different branches of reality and, um, you know, things like All You Zombies by Robert Heinlein and movies like Back to the Future where reality's changed and the lead character gets to, you know, gets to see what happens if his parents were really cool uh, at the end rather than, you know, kind of annoying in the beginning of the movie. So um, those are things that we all kind of imagine. And that's one of the exciting things about uh, parallel universe ideas in fiction. Now, physics does not have any theories, as far as I know, in which you can access realities in which something else happened, like you you won a game instead of losing a game, or you know you you have a different outcome in life. And that doesn't mean that those thoughts are not valid. It's it's you know. F- fine to ruminate about these things. But if somebody wants to delve into the scientific multiverse, then they need to look at ideas like eternal inflation, which imagines multiple versions of the Big Bang. And they would be universes that expand from different seeds. And our universe expanded from a tiny seed but there's other universes expand from tiny seeds and the grown up universes are so far away from each other that we wouldn't possibly have access to them. So, um, so that's called eternal inflation and that's kind of the most scientifically plausible multiverse idea out there today, but it means that we can never access these other universes. So essentially, We would know about these, first of all, through the theoretical speculation. And secondly, if there was any impact on our universe uh, in its early stages from these other universes. So scientists are looking for cases of bubble collisions between our universe and a neighboring universe very early on in the history of the universe. And, uh, you know, they're looking for evidence in the relic radiation left over from the Big Bang to see if there's any um, marks there, scars there of these colli- bubble collisions. So far, they haven't found anything, but that's the most plausible idea of the multiverse. And then there's another idea that's talked about, which is called the many worlds hypothesis, which is an interpretation of quantum mechanics in which we exist as a mixture of quantum states Just like we imagine like an electron, which is an elementary particle, until we measure its position, it's located in a smear of possible positions. 
Well, um, in, in the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics, our consciousness, uh, our conscious existence is in a smear of possibilities and we have different timelines and um, one version of us might imagine one quantum outcome and the other might see another quantum outcome. So in other words, we're tied to the essential ambiguity of a quantum state would be um, tied to us and nothing would ever resolve. We'd, we'd, you know, exist forever in kind of a mixed state of possibilities, which is a very weird idea. But uh, there, it has uh, a number of prominent adherents to it. So those are very different than the idea of, you know, winning a game that you lose in an, in another branch of the universe. Yeah, with the idea that my friend was saying, I I said it sounds more like religion than science when you start talking about like that. It's metaphysics, not physics, um, and it's also very egocentric. It's all about us and what we're doing, um, which is, does actually matter in physics to some degree, right? Because the observer effect um, in quantum mechanics is a real concept, right? Well, that's, that's the irony of the many worlds interpretation. Um, Hugh Everett proposed the many worlds interpretation in the 1950s, to try to eliminate the effects of the observer. So in the orthodox interpretation of quantum mechanics, it takes an observer to lead to what's called wave function collapse. That is, take a blended quantum state and distill it down to one of the possibilities. And that happens through observation. So in the orthodox idea of quantum physics, also known as the Copenhagen interpretation, you might have an electron being a mixture of, let's say, one nanometer to the right of some marker, one nanometer to the left of some marker, right on the mark, et cetera. But you have certain probabilities for it to be in different places, but you don't know its exact position until you specifically take a position measurement. And then once you take a position measurement, it probabilistically collapses into one of those possibilities. So it might collapse into the possibility of being one nanometer to the left of the mark. And then you say, okay, well, that's the um, result of observation, the result of, uh, you know, quantum wave collapse and so forth. That's a standard interpretation. And whoever it thought that was kind of absurd, like why should a human play a, pro a role in a natural process. And uh, he based the idea off of a talk Einstein gave where Einstein jokingly said, well, if humans can trigger quantum collapse, why not a mouse? And Hugh Everett saw that talk and was impressed by Einstein's cynicism and said, yeah, you know, we, we should get rid of the human factor completely. And the way he thought of for getting rid of the human factor was to say that humans are passive they're not active, so they don't play any role in the collapse. They're passive, which means they're part of the same quantum state as the particle. So just like the electron has probabilities of being one place, another place at once, um, instead of a collapse, when taking the observation, the human observer would find themselves in a mixed state. But they wouldn't realize that one version of them, one conscious uh, awareness uh, or conscious, conscious entity would, would sense that the electron is one nanometer to the left of a marker. One would sense that it's one nanometer to the right of the marker. One might sense that it's right on the marker. And those versions would keep going and live out their lives not knowing about the alternatives and... Uh, they would still be in a quantum juxtaposition, just not realizing it. So it's it's very different from the idea of having an alternative view that, you know, uh, wins a game or loses a game. It's more like having an alternative view that has a different outcome of a very specific quantum measurement. So not quite as exciting, but still 
intriguing to think about. Yeah, I mean, for that, most people aren't doing quantum measurements. So it would mostly apply to physicists and people actually doing that kind of work, would it not? Yeah, unless you unless you're you're passively the subject of a quantum event. Okay. For example, you're let's say to to uh look at the Schrodinger's cat thought experiment where Schrodinger's cat is trapped in a box with a radioactive sample. And if the radioactive sample decays, that sets off a vial of poison. And if the radioactive sample doesn't decay, doesn't set off a vial of poison. Well, that's a little bit of an extreme situation, but it might be that there's some kind of radioactive decay, which is a natural quantum event. And um, there might be a version of you that experiences a tiny hit of radiation and a version of you that doesn't experience that tiny hit of radiation. So the chances that that would affect your life are pretty minimal because we're affected by radiation all the time, but you might have a situation where you happen to be near a radioactive sample and you get, you know, a neutron or an electron coming toward you and, you know, probably won't even affect you at all, but you, there might be one version of you which experiences that and another version of you that doesn't experience that. So let's break that down a little bit because um, quantum mechanics is an elusive concept for most people and uh, it's it's not applicable to most people's lives, right? Like what we see in the in the world is, would it be Newtonian physics that explains most of what we see in everyday life? Yeah, so in our daily lives, we live in a Newtonian world in, in terms of what we observe. But there are quantum phenomena, you know, in the periphery of our lives and maybe even come into prominence in certain situations. Like, for example, there's something called polarization. And polarization is a quantum effect uh, where photons, which are light particles, can have two different ways of twisting. So as they travel through space, a photon can twist like a, a, a corkscrew in one direction or in the other direction. Um, it's a little bit like when you're, you know, unlocking a door and locking a door, you, you turn one way, you might turn clockwise, you might turn the other way counterclockwise, or when you're, you know, uh, unscrewing a cork, the corkscrew, it might be twisted one way or twisted the other way. So these are helixes, and uh, as a photon moves through space, it kind of traces out a helix, either a clockwise helix or a counterclockwise helix. And normally, with the light we see is a mixture of both, but if you wear what are called Polaroid sunglasses, which have polarizers in them, they block out half of the light. Um, so they might block out light, which has one kind of helix, and keep the light, which has the different kind of helix. So that's a quantum effect. We just might not realize it, but, you know, polarization is definitely, you know, part of the quantum world, not the classical world, because classically you'd expect light to either completely get through or not completely get through glass. But in the quantum world, it might have um, a certain probability of getting through and, um, you know, or part of it might get through, part of it doesn't get through. So, so we do experience the quantum world sometimes in our lives, but our familiar experiences with the classical world. With Schrodinger's cat, the fact that there's a radioactive material in the box is what makes it a quantum problem, correct? Yes, that's right. Can you explain that a little bit? It's because things break down with a half-life, like we understand radioactive decay to have a half-life, but it, there's a certain unpredictability with it? Exactly. So if you have a radioactive sample, you could get a sample, let's say, of uranium or radium or some kind of radioactive element, 
and you could try to figure out what the half life is. And from the half life, which is, you know, the time for half the sample to decay, you could figure out what the probability is of a decay within, let's say, an hour. And let's say you found a right mixture of a radioactive substance in which the probability of decay in one hour uh, of, of a single decay particle is, happens to be, um, 50, 50. So 50%. And then, you could put that sample in a box and you would say during that hour, according to the standard quantum interpretation, unless you observe the sample, the, uh, the sample is in a, uh, 50% mixture of decayed and not decayed until we observe it because, um, you know, it's in a quantum superposition. So we, we don't say that it's one way or another. We say that it's in a mixture until the observation takes place. And once the observation takes place, the wave function collapses into either decayed or not decayed and with a 50-50 probability. And that's the orthodox model. And if you put a cat in the box, as cruel as that sounds, and note that this, this has never been done, as far as I know, this is just a thought experiment, but you put a Geiger counter and a flask of poison and you have the Geiger counter set up so that it triggers a hammer to break the flask of poison. If the Geiger counter goes off, which means there's a decay, but if the Geiger counter doesn't go off, the hammer doesn't hit the flask of poison and the, um, the sample is preserved and the cat is spared. Um, so anyway, so that's, that's the quandary and you close the box. And then you say that the cat is in, according to the orthodox interpretation, in a 50-50 mixture of alive and dead, just like the samples in a 50-50 mixture of decayed and not decayed until the box is open. Now, that's a little bit absurd, and we, we, we don't believe that to be true in nature. And Hugh Everett's alternative to that, which is the many worlds interpretation, is that there are parallel universes, one of which the sample is decayed and the cat is uh, dead and the other which the sample is not decayed and the cat is alive. And then in the first one, the observer would be mourning upon opening the box and the other, the uh, observer will be rejoicing upon opening the box. And both possibilities would exist and they would go on and live their lives not knowing about their near doppelgangers in the other universe. Yeah, so that's just where the, the theory would end right there is they just go on to live their separate lives and they never have any contact with each other again and two different worlds just go on from that point. Yes. So that that is actually a seamless way to explain in this idea of quantum superposition. But there's a big problem with it that scientists who believe in it are trying to resolve. And that's... What happens if instead of 50 50, so you have, you know, two universes, one with decayed, the other with not decayed, one with the cats dead, the other cats alive. That kind of makes sense. But what if you have a probability of 0. 0.000000 two of some one thing happening, probability of 0.164878. I'm just making up numbers yeah. of another thing happening. So how do you guarantee that these probabilities would pan out in nature and that you would have, you know, more likelihood of ending up in a universe where the most, the more likely things happen? So you would expect that more versions of the observer would end up in the universes where likely events would happen and less versions of the observer would end up in universes where something very light, unlikely would happen. And yet, if the universe splits equally into all the possibilities, then you would have people witnessing these very, very rare events and changing the actual probability of that. So then quantum mechanics wouldn't be predictive at all. So, uh, so scientists especially philosophers of science are trying to come up with 
ways around that idea using what's called game theory, where you can kind of predict a different way how, you know, these different outcomes come up. And the, the different way is by the idea of betting on what's going to happen. And, you know, you might bet on something that's more likely and then be more likely to get a payoff. And there's this idea that because you, you'd be making bets if you could on the more likely outcomes and getting the bigger payoffs that would weigh the scales a little bit in favor of the more likely events. I don't quite buy that, but uh, it's an interesting idea, but I'm not exactly sure, you know, how that would, would pan out in, in you know, Philosophers probably know more than I do about how that scheme would work. So in the event, let's say there's a 99% chance of it going one way and a 1% chance of 99% chance of the cat living, 1% chance of the cat dying. In that scenario, are you essentially saying that there'd be 99 universes that exist with it living and then one one where it doesn't something like that that they're trying to rectify yeah i mean it'd be good if uh if the theory match the idea that you'd be more likely to end up in a universe where something very likely to happen does happen so if you could guarantee that there's 99 versions 99 branches in which the cat would be alive in that case, and one branch in which the cat would be dead, that would work. But what about these really odd probabilities or um, something that's an irrational number? You, you okay. can get something like that. And then, you know, it's just, it, it makes, it, it becomes more and more complicated. And, you know, some philosophers don't really like it when things get super complicated. And uh, they rather have something that's, you know, a simpler model. So the question arises whether or not we'd be able to develop a simple dynamic model that avoids the need for an observer, but also um, guarantees, you know, these quantum outcomes. Gotcha. So with like an irrational number, the problem is that you can't split into partial universes. Um, exactly. Okay. Yeah. And then when you're saying that the less likely scenario having a, an outcome increases the likelihood of that outcome being observed, can you explain that a little bit more? So, yeah, I mean, it's there's there's this idea that that if you have uh, anticipations for a certain outcome. And you made a kind of a, a bet on that outcome and you were, you know, the bet was tied to a payoff that there'd be more, more versions of the universe in which uh, that would happen where, where you would receive, you know, you would, because of the payoff, you would be more likely to, um, end up in something, a universe where that outcome occurs. Okay. Awesome. Um, before you got into the science in the book, you actually touched on some philosophy like Nietzsche and how philosophy was already uh, postulating the idea of multiple universes. Can you dive into that a little bit? So um, there are... Uh, various philosophers throughout history have postulated other worlds, alternative worlds. In Nietzsche's case, Nietzsche imagined other worlds in the future. So imagine that if you, and this is based upon purely Newtonian mechanics, imagine that if you uh, ran a system, even a deterministic system, which had a finite number of elements, a finite number of possibilities, but you had an infinite space or an infinite playing field, eventually you'd run out of combinations and you would repeat 
the same uh, series of events again and again. And he called that eternal return. And you would end up with, um, you know, repeating history. And uh, he imagined himself the prophet of eternal return and imagined that he would come back again and again to prophesize eternal return and sort of be venerated for that, the eternal prophet of eternal return. So it uh, kind of, he, he had some, you know, issues with, with that, with, with feel, you know, feeling a, a little bit narcissistic at times and, and, you know, emotional issues there. So it might have been tied in with that, but it's similar to the idea that let's say you're a tic tac toe aficionado and you play tic tac toe every day with a friend and you play it for hours and hours and hours very quickly you'll run out of possibilities because the square has you know nine different spaces and um you know there's just an x and an o and you know you only have a finite number of possible games so you don't see people normally who are playing tic-tac-toe for like 10 hours every day for years because they would quickly run out of possibilities and repeat the same games again and again. Now for chess, there's 64 squares and, you know, I guess, uh, 16 pieces on each side. So there's a lot more possibilities, but still, if you play chess again and again for years or imagine somebody who lived to 120 and played it every day for 120 years, it would in greatly increase the odds of repeating the same game. Gotcha. Um, and at a certain point, it was early in the book, this idea of like kind of reverse entropy was touched on. Is that a scientific idea or is that a, a philosophical concept? Like of like entropy, things kind of go into chaos and it kind of, there is this notion of things just returning and it would take an, an insanely long amount of time for like that original state of something to return. But it, there was this idea floated that it could happen. Can you dive into that? Yeah. So that is called Poincaré recurrence. And if you look at a deterministic system, like a Newtonian system that has a finite number of elements, depending on how many elements there are, you can calculate the time for the moves to repeat themselves. And uh, let's say you had, you know, three atoms in, you know, a jar, a small jar. And as atoms were bouncing around in the jar, you could calculate how long it would take before the three atoms happened to be back in the same position and having the same speeds. So that would be considered a recurrence of the state. And uh, you could do that with three atoms, four atoms, and each time it would be longer. You could also do that with, I mentioned tic-tac-toe, you can calculate how many how long it will be before you would repeat the same moves in tic-tac-toe. And that's called the Poincaré recurrence. But if you had something with the number of atoms in the universe and the size of the universe, um, if the universe was, you know, talk about the size of the observable universe and the number of atoms in the observable universe, and assuming the universe was not expanding, which is a false assumption because it is expanding. But let's say we had a, a universe that was just static. You can calculate how long it would take for all the atoms in the universe to be back in the same position that they were at a certain time. And that would be astronomically long, much, 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 much longer than the time that the universe has existed hmm. by an enormous amount of magnitude, like unfathomably long. So therefore, it's unlikely, extremely unlikely, that things will go back to the original state. So um, you can use that to make an argument for entropy, 
So entropy is how, you know, how unlikely or likely a, a particular state is. But as time goes on, states go from special states or rare states to more and more common states. So, um, for example, if you look at, um, tossing coins by analogy, if you took a, a, a bucket full of coins, let's say a hundred coins, let's say pennies, and you toss them, the most likely state is 50 heads and 50 tails. So that state would be the state with, with the highest entropy, um, because it's the most likely state and a state with one head and 99 tails would be a very unlikely state. So that would be the state with the lowest entropy. Now, if you start with, if you started with a set of coins and one of them was heads and the, uh, and the other 99 were tails, you put them in a bucket and you kept tossing them over and over again, they'd most likely end up 50 heads and 50 tails. But if you kept doing it a long enough amount of time, eventually you might end up with one head and 99 tails, but it might take, you know, hours or days to do that. So that means effectively you're going from a, a low entropy situation would be like one head and 99 tails. Effectively, you'd go to a high entropy situation, which would be 50 heads and 50 tails, unless you waited for you know super long amount of time in which case there'd be a slim chance of reversing back to the low entropy state but if you take the whole universe or even earth or even you know a typical system with you know billions of atoms the chances of going randomly back to the low entropy state are so tiny that we say effectively Entropy must increase. So you must go from the most, the least likely sy systems to the more likely systems. Okay. So as far as a multiverse theory from that kind of thing, it's just not necessarily impossible, but impossible to ever view it because it's just, it would have to take so long for any reconstruction of the universe and like a reverse entropy to happen. Yeah. So Nietzsche's idea that earth would be recreated and he would be recreated and he'd say the same things and so forth. Um, you know, and, and some people talk about deja vu as being a repetition of time to speculate about that. I mean, that is so improbable that you would have to imagine that the universe will last for trillions upon trillions of years, you know, uh, so long that these events would recur. Plus the fact that the universe is expanding and that stars are dying, will die out eventually. Galaxies, you know, will burn out. Stars will turn, some stars will turn into black holes yeah, and so forth. It makes it incredibly unlikely to have this kind of recurrence. But it's a fun thing to think about, but it's, yeah, it's, it's so unlikely that, you know, to wait for this to happen, you know, it doesn't really seem to make sense. Yeah. You're talking trillions of years and the universe is what around 15 billion years old? Uh, four, 14 billion years 14 old. Billion. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, and, and I, and I say trillions is kind of a, a place saver to, uh, you know, it's actually, 10 to the 10th to the 10th, you know, it's, you know, beyond words we have for, for, you know, numbers. So with the many worlds interpretation, how would somebody go about testing to see if a multiverse actually did exist? Well, the, as mentioned, the, um, Eternal inflation is probably the most plausible okay. multiverse scheme. And the tests they're looking for is to look at the relic radiation left over from the Big Bang. Okay. So 
you know, some years after the Big Bang, when the universe started to cool down a little bit, the first atoms formed. And when atoms formed, all this light radiation was released into space and can suddenly travel through space. And that light was very hot at first, but has since cooled down. And today, the universe is full of a kind of bath of radiation, but the radiation has cooled down so much that instead of being, you know, visible light or, or, you know, higher energy than that, it's very, very low energy light, which is in the form of radio waves. So the universe is full of these radio waves and the radio waves at different spots in the universe have very, very slightly different temperatures depending on how they were formed. So if they were formed in a place that were, that there was very little matter, you know, billions of years ago, they might have a lower temperature. They're formed in a place which is higher matter, slightly higher amount of matter, they would have a higher temperature. So uh, astronomers see this when they map out the radio sky, they can map out the temperature of different parts of the sky and see very slight discrepancies between the different parts of the sky. And that's sometimes called the baby picture of the universe. It's a temperature map of the universe, kind of like a temperature map a meteorologist would have, but with much more subtle temperatures. So not, you don't vary from like uh, 50 degrees Celsius to zero degrees Celsius. You might vary from, you know, 2.7 three, you know, degrees Kelvin to, you know, very slight difference from that. So very subtle uh, variations and very, very cold temperatures. But anyway, if the universe, if our universe collided with another universe, uh, scientists predict a kind of ring of radiation, subtle ring in spots around the sky that might be potentially detectable. And that would be leftover scar of this, this bubble collision. And that's what some scientists are, are looking for. Okay. Can we back up a little bit with the eternal inflation? How does, how did the other universes come into play? So we have the, the universe is inflating. And is it just because it, it's, I guess, yeah, I don't, I don't quite understand the eternal inflation from the beginning. Like, why does the multiverse happen? Like, why is it postulated? Well, inflation is a theory that the universe went through a very, very early period of ultra rapid expansion, exponential expansion. So the question is, what could cause such ultra rapid expansion? And as scientists such as Andre Linde showed, you can have something called a scalar energy field. And scalar is a fancy term, but it just means has a single value from point to point. So it's some kind of energy field that has different uh, values of energy at different points. And if this energy might change over time, but if you had a certain type of energy pop up in a certain part of space, uh, according to Einstein's general theory of relativity, either matter or energy can trigger expansion. Hmm. So um, Einstein's general theory of relativity says that mass and energy affect geometry and in different ways. And if you have a scalar energy field that means a very stable, steady source of energy that kind of lights the flame for uh, ultra rapid expansion. And once you're sitting in that situation, once a part of space has is exposed to that energy for a certain amount of time, that leads to the universe to blow up, you know, kind of like if you, um, if you had like some kind of Bunsen burner under a balloon and the air just started to rapidly expand in the balloon, 
you know, essentially like a hot air balloon. Huh. So imagine the hot air balloons that go off into the air and they have like a little burner under them that expands the air and the air gets heated and the balloon expands very quickly. That's a little bit like inflation. And then at some point, the source of energy decays or burns out and then the universe reverts to normal expansion doesn't pop it just starts expanding much more slowly and becomes you know the conventional expansion of the universe well it turns out that producing these scalar energy fields at different parts of the early universe is really really easy and producing them with the right profile for them to be steady and then to drop off so it's a little bit like walking along a plateau, like suddenly you're in a desert and you see a plateau, you climb up to the top of the plateau and you're walking along the plateau and at some point it drops off. Well, if there's one plateau, why not other plateaus in that desert? There might be other people walking along other plateaus. And in each case, when you have that plateau, it in, in general relativity, that triggers this kind of expansion event. So that means that you might have these plateaus in different places, expanding bubble universes in different places. So instead of having just a single inflation event, you might have multiple inflation events. And in fact, it's likely that this would happen again and again and again in many different places, creating uh, a bubble universe where you have all these inflating bubbles and some, and they would inflate at different rates. Some of them might almost immediately start to collapse and some of them might inflate very slowly and, you know, so slowly that, um, you know, you never have the, the kinds of structure that uh, we see in our universe. So they'd be co basically competing universes and only some of them would produce, you know, situations where you have, uh, stable stars and stable planets and something like we have in our universe. So inflation is something that we, we believe happened with our universe and the possible cause is other universes kind of colliding with ours at the early stages. Is that, am I interpreting that right? No, inflation is something that naturally happened to universe early on in its history and um and then in, in different places uh inflation stopped and became a uh, regular growth hmm. so you go from inflationary growth which is super super rapid which couldn't really be sustained if you wanted planets and life to slow growth which allows for planets and stars to form and this happened in multiple places. The collisions are just a speculation that you might have two bubbles that are near each other and at some point in their history banged into each other and formed a scar. And, but that's not necessary for internal inflation. It's just will be a nice way of proving it, but it's possible that you'd have inter eternal inflation with all these bubbles and the bubbles never, you know, even approached each other. Okay. I guess I'm still a little confused in how the multi multiple universes come into play with the eternal inflation. So if eternal inflation was just there, why multiple universes have to come into play at all? Well, because you'd have the different bubbles. Each bubble would produce its own universe. So you'd have one inflation event, let's say, one point in the original space, and then somewhere else, you'd have another bubble forming and those two bubbles would continue to grow. And as they grew, they would get farther and farther apart from each other because it's space itself is blowing up. So then you would essentially have two different universes. Now, if this was happening again and again, you would have multiple universes and that's why we call it a multiverse. Gotcha. So with those, in those situations, would the multiverse one multi one universe have anything to do with the other one other like would they have any similarities well we we wouldn't know but they might have different 
natural constants. They might have different properties. Um, so it would become more, more of a theoretical exercise unless we could somehow establish, you know, through these bubble collisions that they interacted with each other early on. But if they didn't interact, then there would be no way of accessing them today. So it would be kind of a hypothetical construct. Gotcha. Yeah. So if they had high gravity, for instance, they would eventually collapse on themselves. And if they had low gravity, it would just kind of expand Forever, too quickly yeah. for anything to ever really, any life or planets to develop and things like that, correct? Yeah. So they might have other forces involved. There's something called dark energy, which is this unknown anti-gravity force that if dark energy is too large and gravity is too weak, then you have continued expansion that's so fast that you never have, you never have um, uh, uh, the formation of stars and planets. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, so we still don't know exactly what dark matter is. It's just this entity that we can't really pinpoint what its utility or what it's what it is. Yeah, so in this case we're talking about dark energy, but we also didn't know what dark matter oh, dark is. Dark energy, sir. So dark energy is the missing ingredient that's causing uh the ex expansion of the universe to accelerate, to speed up. And dark matter is a missing ingredient that's gluing uh, galaxies together and gluing stars into galaxies because there's not enough visible matter to um, to prove to show that galaxies are stable. What is the best interpretation currently for what dark matter and dark energy are? Well, there are many different theories. Um, some physicists believe that the law of gravity or Einstein's general theory of relativity needs to be modified. And that's one way of dealing with the situation, modifying general relativity. But the problem is general relativity is an incredibly successful theory. It's been tested again and again. So modifying it means that you would have to explain all the experiments where general relativity is successful. So just predicting the bending of starlight during a solar eclipse. And we do have a uh, total solar eclipse coming up in the United States soon. So it's something I'm sure some scientists could test that if there's a star that happens to be in the sky in the vicinity of the solar eclipse, the star would appear to be in a different place because of the bending of the starlight. And then you can use that to to test general relativity and make sure it has, you know, the predictions are, are on target. But if you modify general relativity, then you have to explain all of the experiments and you have to justify that. So that's one idea. But the leading idea for dark matter is that there are unknown particles that are relatively cold, meaning relatively slow, so that they can glue things together, glue visible particles together, but they don't interact very easily. So, so the, the, the acronym for those, the old fashioned acronym is WIMPs, weakly interacting massive particles, mm. uh, as opposed to machos or massive compact halo objects which are another theory of dark matter uh, these terms have been around for a while and uh you know we think that the wimps are weakly interacting massive particles it might form the missing ingredients to weld the galaxies together and into clusters but they have in many years of searches, decades of searching, we haven't been able to find these particles. And we also haven't been able to find the missing agents of dark energy. How does how do people even go about exploring that? I mean, you're talking about things that are 
I mean, millions of light years away, I'd imagine. Um, how do you go about testing that? And is it possible to actually definitively prove what it is? Well, with dark matter, we think if dark matter exists, it should be everywhere. It's just weakly interacting, meaning, meaning it goes right through us normally. So you would have to find a way of blocking uh, everything that's common and finding these rare events. Hmm. So what they do is they take uh, abandoned mines or um, tunnels deep under mountains. So in Italy, it's a place called Gran Sasso, which is essentially a highway tunnel and uh, goes under mountains going from, you know, you know, going from Rome to the sea. And um, this highway tunnel is the main reason for it is, is to uh, facilitate traffic. But scientists got the idea of building an observatory inside the mountain. So you go into the tunnel and then you go off in an exit and you're in the observatory. And then you, you can have a tanks full of fluid, which are sensitive to detecting particles. And then you look for um, signs using special detectors of the energy and momentum profiles of decay particles. And you test to see if those might have the same profiles as the decay of hypothetical dark matter particles. Hmm. And another way of looking for these will be um, collision experiments and things like the Large Hadron Collider or um, going off into space and trying to detect these things. So there are many proposed ideas for detecting dark matter. And dark energy, um, we're trying to map out the ex accelerated expansion of the universe see if that's constant or if it's changes in time and space, and also trying to look for potential hypothetical particles that could cause that. Kristen, you mentioned the Large Hadron Collider, and apparently there's some, I guess, conspiracy or conjecture about the Mandala effect and like CERN and, and stuff like that. People think that maybe parallel universes have been created already uh, or created by the use of like the Large Hadron Collider. And that's why we have like the Mandala effect where people remember things that aren't accurate. Um, have you heard about that at all? Well, I didn't know about the Large Hadron Collider being accused of creating the Mandela effect, but I have heard of the Mandela effect. And um, I don't believe that that has anything to do with physics or parallel universes. I think uh, it's named after the great South African leader, Nelson Mandela. And in my opinion, it's, it's a lack of people in North America actually following the news and following history of Africa and South Africa, which explains why a certain segment of the population thought that he, that Nelson Mandela had died in prison when in reality he was gloriously released and became president of the Republic of South Africa and was president for a time and then retired as president and lived into, I think, 90 or in his 90s and uh, had a very long life and was uh, venerated and, uh, you know, my memory, as I try to follow international news, I remember very distinctly him be, being president and his later years and people visiting him and so forth. But if someone happens to not follow the news and just all they know about Nelson Mandela is that, that he was in prison and they say, oh, I wonder what happened to him. Maybe he died in prison. I mean, that's not the fault of parallel universes. That's yeah. just a lack of following the news. And some of the other examples of the Mandela effect is mixing up brand names. Like I think there's one peanut butter named uh, Jif and another named Skippy peanut butter. And some people mix the two names up and say Jiffy. Well, 
I mean, yeah. the brain is liable to mix things up. Human brains are not perfect and we misremember things. So the fact that a segment of people misremember something, I think just might mean that it's a common mistake or a common error rather than going to, you know, parallel universe and then blaming this poor large Chandra collider, you know, for yeah. creating this parallel universe and creating all these memory effects when it could just be that people naturally mix things up. We had a situation in Pennsylvania where uh, a, someone named Dr. Mehmet Oz ran for Senate in Pennsylvania and he, and he did a, a commercial for his campaign and he mixed up two Pennsylvania supermarkets and combined the two names. So it was just perhaps he just, you know, was tired and had been to both supermarkets and combined the two names of the supermarkets. I wouldn't attribute that to a parallel universe. Yeah, I think we, and we tend to overestimate how good our memories are. So we misremember something and then maybe we tell somebody and they remember it based on what we're telling them. And one of the ones that I found was uh, in Star Wars, apparently, I, I haven't gone back to watch to confirm this, but a lot of people remember it as Luke, I am your father, but apparently it says, no, I am your father which I find very interesting because I think part of that has to do with it's been repeated as Luke, I am your father so many times now too, that it's not just the original movie that people are remembering. It's all the references that were incorrect to the movie. Yeah. So, but that, you know, I'm old enough to remember when people would imitate, you know, the classic Hollywood stars, you know, like um, Jimmy Cagney, like you dirty rat, you dirty rat, get out of my, you know, get get out of here or something. And people would do these imitations, and maybe it would be something that the characters never even said. It would just be something that an impersonator would just pick up on and just start doing an impersonation and make up something. And people would assume that the character that that um, was something the character actually said. You know, another example is the character Igor from the Frankenstein movies. Mm. And everybody remembers Igor talking like Peter Laurie, like, you know, like Boris Karloff, I'm going to go get the, get the equipment in, you know, and that's uh, Peter Laurie, the actor, but Peter Laurie never played Igor. Um, it was other actors playing Igor and Igor never sounded like that. It's just that some, at some point an impersonator wanted to do Igor and it might go back to the song, The Monster Mash, uh, where they, they had someone play Igor or an imitation of Igor using the Peter Lorre voice, you know, and then it just stuck. And now everybody thinks that Igor sounds like Peter Lorre. Yeah. Yeah. It's with, uh, the Star Wars reference. I actually, when I think of that quote, I don't think of the original movie. I think of, uh, I think it's the movie Tommy Boy with Chris Farley because he's, talking into a fan saying, Luke, 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 I am your father. So when I think of that quote, it's actually not even the original movie that comes to my mind. It's a reference of that. So it touches on what you're saying. We, uh, we hear interpretations or impressions and we tend to remember those more than the original sometimes. So, so oh, yeah. to get away from the, you know, conjecture about it that I think people just kind of, People want to make up stories to uh, explain why they don't remember things right. What is CERN? What is the Large Hadron Collider actually doing? So it's been uh, smashing particles together, usually protons, which are positively charged elementary particles. And uh, if it smashes two protons together, what happens is you have uh, a ring a giant ring and uh, the ring goes under farmland in France and part, part, part of it's in Switzerland and most of it's in France. So I like to joke that um, it's lucky that the particles don't have to go through passport control when they pass through the two different countries. So that would really slow things down. But anyway, um, so you go through this giant 
the particles go around a giant ring and get faster and faster until they're essentially going close to the speed of light, in which case you really can't get them much faster, but you can improve their energy. You can get them to be more and more energetic. And that means essentially they become more massive. So the protons, when they're traveling close to the speed of light, act like much, much heavier particles. And that's according to Einstein's theories, uh, E equals MC squared, and the idea that um, mass increases with speed and uh, relativistic mass. Now, if you take one proton or a bunch of protons and you have it go clockwise around the ring and you have another bunch of protons go counterclockwise, and then once they've reached the sufficient mass, you trigger them the two bunches of protons to collide with each other right when they reach the detector, then suddenly you have this flood of particles produced in the collision. And because the particle, the original protons have become so massive, you can get um, very massive particles produced in the collision, at least for a, a split second. And then those particles might decay and that's how they found what's called the Higgs boson, which is a particle normally you wouldn't see in nature, but because we, we sped up the protons to such high energies that it was possible to produce these, uh, in the collision, uh, debris. And, uh, that's what they're doing is, is essentially creating these massive particles just from the fact that they're accelerating the protons so much. And sometimes they switch out the protons for ions, which means you take an atom and you remove some of its outer electrons and it becomes ionized. And then you see other things like, you know, uh, colliding to basically parts of atoms together and see what happens in the debris. Is this how new I mean, elements that are higher up in the periodic table that aren't stable on earth can be created temporarily yeah i think you could uh you could do that to create temporary elements you know that are higher in the periodic table i don't know specifically if that's been done in that collider they might be done in other colliders but that's one way of trying to create artificial elements and these particles and things that are created in the colliders, are they things that would be more stable if the gravitational constant was higher, if like higher gravity? They'd be more stable if the universe was hotter mm. and like conditions around the time of the Big Bang, but then we wouldn't be here. Yeah. So the fact that they're unstable means that basically they produce the the spectrum of particles that we see today, including the electrons, the low energy electrons and low energy protons and low energy neutrons that are in atoms to create stable atoms. So if we wanted to a situation where you have these very stable high mass particles, you couldn't have stable atoms. So you so you couldn't have people living in the collider conditions. Yeah. So aside from eternal inflation, which you feel is the most likely uh, explanation for any multiverse, uh, any pot potential multiverses, and uh, then you have the many worlds interpretation, there's also a string theory, which leads to some multiverses. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? So string theory is the idea that you replace point particles with energetic strands that vibrate and in their vibrations, they vibrate in different ways. Sometimes they twist, sometimes, you know, they vibrate with different frequencies and they, they'll create the spectrum of elementary particles that way. But it's a very mathematical theory. The reason they replace point particles with vibrating strands is because some of the calculations, if you assume that a particle is infinitesimal, meaning close to zero in, in uh, scale, 
you do a calculation and you have to divide by the radius of the particle or divide by the length of the particle and you end up dividing by zero. And that's kind of a no-no on calculators, computers, you don't want to divide by zero and you end up with infinite terms. So in uh, standard particle theory related to uh, electromagnetism, there's ways of canceling out the infinite terms so they don't create a problem. But with gravity, they found that to, for a quantum theory of gravity, there's no way to cancel out the infinite terms and get a stable quantum theory of gravity with point particles. But if you switch to vibrating strands, then the theory becomes finite. You don't have these infinite terms, and that's really a good thing mathematically. But there's some problems with string theory, and one of the problems is that string theory is only makes sense mathematically in at least 10 dimensions. So we live in a spatial world of three dimensions, and if you add in time, that's four dimensions. So we don't perceive 10 dimensions, but string theory only makes sense mathematically if you have at least 10 dimensions. So you would think that would be a reason to reject the theory, but string theorists say, no, let's try to explain why we can only observe four dimensions. And one way of doing it is to imagine that the six higher dimensions are curled up so tiny that they can't be observed. Kind of like little pretzel twists or tiny, tiny donuts, tiny, you know, cheese swirls, whatever your, your favorite uh, snack is that's curled up very tiny. And, um, it turns out though, there are 10 to the 500 power ways to curl up these extra dimensions. And, uh, that's a problem for string theory because that means that there are 10 to the 500 possibilities. And each of them creates its own kind of universe with its own constants, its own laws. So one way of narrowing that down is to imagine that you have a multiverse in which you have all these possibilities, but only one of them or a handful of them are viable. And those are the ones that we live in. Or maybe there's even just one that's viable, which will be our universe. And all the others give you laws and constants that are not viable for life. And therefore, there couldn't be any beings in those, those worlds, those alternative universes. So no one would be there to report that they live there. And that's an example of what's called the anthropic principle saying that you can rule out universe possibilities, parallel universe possibilities in which, um, you know, no planets, no stars, no life could form. Yeah. Uh, and there are some pretty heavy criticisms of string theory. I mean, for what you were saying, like it can't, it seems to be just mathematical, like not really relatable to the real world. And I've heard, I think Eric Weinstein has some pretty heavy criticisms for string theory in that it has occupied so much time and resources in physics without producing much. Am I right there? Yeah, I mean, it's it's controversial. People who are advocates of string theory say something like it's the only game in town because it's finite, has these finite vibrations instead of infinitesimal particles. So there's a certain elegance there of not having infinite terms. but there are a lot of physicists who argue that we haven't had any experimental evidence for it and it's time to move on to other theories. But part of the problem is there hasn't been any experimental evidence for the alternative. So if something turned up for the other theories as experimental evidence, then I think everyone immediate, would immediately gravitate to the more testable theories. Yeah, and science is full of the history of science is full of examples where people have clung to theories that ended up not being right because it's it's hard as a scientist to put 20, 30, 40 years into researching something and then it ends up not being right and then you have to pivot away from what you've spent your life working on, I would imagine. 
Yeah, that's very true. And there's some cases where something that's believed by the vast majority of the scientific community turns out to be wrong. In some cases where it turns out to be right. Like, for example, I'll give you examples of both. For example, starting in the 1870s, almost every reputable scientist believed in what's called a lum luminiferous ether or ether for short, which is the um, substance in which light vibrates because light is a wave as shown in the, you know, Maxwell's theory, you know, in the mid 19th century. And scientists believe that any wave must have a material to move through because otherwise what vibrates? If you, if you have a wave, you would need something to vibrate. So everybody believed in the ether and Einstein came along in 1905 and he didn't say the ether is wrong, but he said, we don't need to use the ether in our theory. And he came up with the special theory of relativity, which basically worked around the idea of the ether and showed that there was no need for ether in any of the theories. But the ether idea persisted and it was only probably by the mid 20th century that like no one believed in the ether. So it persisted for for many decades where people believed in the ether. And there's another example, gravitational waves that was originally proposed by Einstein in the 1910s, but then his original proposal wasn't really viable. And then it made a comeback a little bit in the 1930s when he, Einstein and Rosen published a paper on gravitational waves. And then in the 1950s, researchers such as Joseph Weber started exploring building detectors for gravitational waves. But that turned out to be controversial because he claimed detection of gravitational waves, but other people didn't find them. So his work was disregarded. And there were still some scientists who said, well, maybe gravitational waves are a pipe dream, or maybe they'll never be detected. And it was only in recent decades, past decade, that scientists detected gravitational waves using the LIGO apparatus. And now they're detecting gravitational waves very commonly. And it's something that's you know, a key part of science, key part of astronomy. Now that we talk about multi-messenger astronomy, not just electromagnetic signals, but also gravitational signals. So those who kept going with the search for gravitational waves, like the physicist Ray Weiss, who ended up winning a Nobel Prize for it, he started exploring the idea in the 1960s. And then he persisted for, you know, for many, many decades before he got results. Mm -hmm. So sometimes it's worth it to be persistent. Sometimes it's not worth it to be persistent because it turns out to be wrong. So you just never know, you know, so it's good for at least some group of people to be exploring these ideas. Yeah, yeah, definitely. With Einstein's theory of relativity, there was a constant used in at least one of them. And I think he called it one of his biggest blunders or something like that. Can you dive into that a little bit? Yeah, so Einstein developed his general theory of relativity in 1915. And then in 1917, he developed his first theory of the universe, trying to apply his idea of that matter and energy affect geometry to the universe. And he thought that he knew what the answer would be. He thought he would end up with a finite, stable universe, uh, kind of like a frozen balloon, which would just be, you know, uh, stuck there. And that would uh, show us why the universe is static, uh, why the universe is self-supporting, self-consistent. So he wanted to explain certain theories using a frozen, finite universe. But to his horror, he plugged his uh, matter and energy of the universe into his equations. And he showed that the universe is unstable, that it either expands or contracts, but doesn't stay frozen, doesn't stay static. So he decided to add an extra term called the cosmological constant term, which is a um, 
a term that serves as a kind of anti-gravity that pushes uh, things further away from each other and it stops gravitational collapse. So if you have a situation where the universe is about to collapse, it stabilizes it and can create a stable universe. But then almost immediately, Willem de Sitter, a Dutch physicist, showed that if you took the same model, got rid of the matter and energy, you could produce a universe that expands exponentially fast because of this cosmological constant. So the cosmological constant was not just a stabilizing term, but can cause uh, accelerated expansion if you use it the right way. So it's it's kind of a something that could be used to stabilize and something could be used to destabilize, which is a little weird. And then when in 1929, uh, Edwin Hubble produced uh, evidence that galaxies are receding from each other, moving away from each other. And uh, that was used as evidence for an expanding universe, which later became called the Big Bang Theory. Einstein withdrew the idea of a cosmological constant. And he said, oh, well, the universe is unstable after all. And he called the, uh, apparently called the cosmological constant the greatest blunder of his life. Hmm. And uh, it's a little bit controversial because no one heard him say it directly, but yeah. George Gamow, who worked with Einstein, uh, reported that. So probably a pretty credible source. So anyway, um, but that was almost forgotten about, but made a revival in the 1990s when they discovered the accelerating expansion of the universe. And that led to the idea of dark energy. And the cosmological constant is one way of modeling dark energy. It kind of models the idea of a constant anti-gravity term in the universe. Yeah, um, it's interesting. You, you mentioned that it's controversial about whether he said it or not. It seems likely that he did, but Einstein is one of those people who, like Mark Twain, gets attributed quotes that may or may not have actually been said by him. So one other thing I wanted to ask you about is you, you said the word, the anthropic principle. Can you explain a little bit about what that is and how that ties into everything? So the anthropic principle was proposed by Brandon Carter in 1970, and it's basically an idea that either there are many different parts of our universe with a lot of different conditions, and that's pretty widely accepted that different parts of a universe have different conditions, and that's called the weak anthropic principle. And we need to be in a part of the universe that's amenable for planet formation, amenable for life. So if we were in let's say, the very center of the galaxy where you have these massive stars and giant black holes and perhaps radiation falling into the black holes and all this you know, stuff that's not really conducive to life, then we, we probably wouldn't be here and then we wouldn't be talking about it. So the fact that we're here means that we must be in a part of the universe which is just about right for life, that conditions are are nice for life, mm. uh, not too strong, a uh, gravitational force, not too weak, constants are just right. But then um, the strong anthropic principle imagines an array of universes, all with different natural constants, all with different conditions, and says we're likely to be in the parallel universe or one of the many parallel universes which has just the right constants hmm. to produce stable structures such as stars to produce planetary systems to produce life. Interesting. Yeah. So, I mean, so part of the anthropic principle is we're here because we're here essentially. <laughs> yes. We are here because if the conditions were very different, we wouldn't be here. Yeah. Okay. Right. Makes sense. Um, well, Professor Halpern, it's been awesome talking to you. Uh, one thing I like to ask uh, guests that come on the show is about books that have influenced you throughout your life. I know you've written 18 books yourself, so uh, we'll move on to that after. But 
I would love to hear any books that you recommend that you've read of other authors that have really influenced you throughout your life. Well, when I was a kid, I read the book One, Two, Three, Infinity by George Gamow, which is a wonderful popular science book. And it explored with wonderful illustrations, things like the fourth dimension and uh, chirality, which means left-handedness and right-handedness. And I really got, you know, a lot of ideas from that book to, you know, avenues to explore and things to be interested in. So I highly recommend that one. Um, some of the works of Martin Gardner, such as co collections of his essays, there are multiple collections. I really liked also stimulated things to think about. And, uh, well, I never met either of them. I interacted with Martin Gardner once. I sent him a copy of one of my books and he enjoyed it and I interviewed him once. Uh, so he's one of my heroes. Let's see. Works of Isaac Asimov, such as the Foundation series, works of Ray Bradbury, another great science fiction writer, um, such as the Martian Chronicles and uh, many of his other short stories. So, um, and then um, I enjoy all, you know, different types of literature. I'm a fan of everything from, um, from Dickens to uh, Connie Willis, who's a modern writer who writes about time travel. So uh, too many authors to name. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, before we wrap up, will you give listeners a Tell listeners how they can find your book. Um, feel free to elaborate anything else you want about the book and other books that you've written. If you want to tell them about those as well, feel free to share anything you'd like. Well, first of all, I should advise my books are available in this universe. You don't have to step into a parallel universe to get them. And they're available in independent bookstores. I can plug one in my area, Main Point Books in Wayne, Pennsylvania. I go there often and I can sign books personally there. That's Main Point Books in Wayne, Pennsylvania. If you want a personally autographed copy, but you can go to any independent bookstore in your region, uh, available internationally in independent bookstores, but also chains such as the good people at Barnes and Noble and Books a Million and other chain, chains of bookstores, Waterstones, and uh, many great uh, chains that support authors by having author events. And then there are the online uh, bookstores such as Amazon.com and other on online booksellers that carry my book. So there are many different options. Awesome. Thank you. I love that you uh, you talked about the smaller bookstores first because Amazon gets plenty of business. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anything else you'd like to share before we wrap up? No, it's a wonderful talking to you and I'm glad we covered so many different topics. And, uh, you know, I think the multiverse is something that's fun to explore both in literature and in science. And i certainly would encourage looking at some of the movies about the multiverse and I actually have online my personal selection of top 10 movies about the multiverse, which is, is on the, uh, is courtesy of the magazine New Scientist, but is available online. If you want my suggestions for multiverse movies, starting with It's a Wonderful Life and ending with Everything Everywhere All at Once. So there's a wide range of multiverse movies out there and a lot of books, which multiverse themes and a lot of good science behind multiverse speculation but it's been a pleasure being on your show yeah thank you thank you so much for joining me today thanks professor halpern hey great thank you for listening to this episode of thoughtfully mindless if you're enjoying the podcast please leave a five-star review on spotify and apple it goes a long way in helping the podcast grow and reach more listeners you can also like and subscribe on youtube and if you want to support the show, you can go to FractalZoo.net where I have unique Fractal-inspired clothing. Each purchase goes directly toward helping the podcast grow. I'll also leave my Amazon affiliate link in the description. 
You can click on that before making an Amazon purchase and a small commission may go to the podcast. I love to connect with my audience, so find me on Twitter or X at RTM Podcast. That's A R T I E T M Podcast. Or you can find me on Instagram at Thoughtfully Mindless. Thank you for listening today. That's it for this one. Until next time, stay thoughtfully mindless. <laughs>